we're going to be walking through these five topics that relate to seed saving. I'm just going to walk us through and then take a minute to share a little bit about myself. So we'll, uh, very quickly, we'll talk a bit about why it's important to save seeds and then choosing plants to save from, seed from and when, then how to harvest and process and um, store your seeds down here. And if you're interested in seed germination, I'll share a little bit about that. And then how to plan for next year's garden with seed saving in mind. Um, whoops. Um, so a little bit about myself. I uh, own the Good Seed Company. It's an heirloom seed company um, out of Whitefish, Montana, whose mission is to um, help reestablish the community practice of selecting, saving, and sharing seeds for common use. Uh, we only sell um, open pollinated heirloom seeds that you can save, and uh, we do that for the backyard grower, so folks just like you. Um, I also want to introduce people, to, if you don't know about this statewide organization called Aero. It's a nonprofit. It's 47 years old, and it's been dedicated to helping build resilient community food systems over that time um, by helping producers and farmers uh, learn how to be practice sustainable agriculture and develop healthy food using renewable energy practices and make resilient farm systems that. Uh, work well in community food systems. So highly recommend everybody join their, they are the, a great resource for helping building resiliency in our communities. So why save seed? Now, um, I'll, I'll whip through this, but it's important that everybody um, know a little bit about why it's so important in this day and age. So forgive me if you've heard this before, but I, I have to say it every time I talk. So why save seed? So the deal is that what's at stake is that in the last 100 years, we have lost over 95% of the crop diversity of agricultural crops in the United States, um, period. So that's what's happened. And um, the deal is that our food starts with seeds, whether we eat a plant-based diet or we eat meat, the animals that we hunt, they eat plants. So our food starts with seeds, period. And in the 16,000 years that humans have been uh, practicing agriculture, we are the ones who have created all the crop diversity that we have. This is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of varieties that we have created. And we created this diversity by following three basic steps. We selected varieties that we liked for some particular reason, we saved the seed for them, and we shared the seed. Those are the three characteristics for building diversity. So just an example of what we've done. There's a picture of wild carrot. Doesn't look anything like the carrots we eat today. This is wild corn. Uh, this is what wild wheat, this one little line here, used to look like. And we've developed it and on and on and on. There's over 40,000 varieties of rice as an example. So you can see that cultures who um, developed grain varieties that worked in their area developed a lot of diversity and um, varieties that were important to them. So, and of those three things, selecting, saving, and sharing, all of which are important, I lean a little bit more into the sharing. And the sharing is because it mixes up the DNA a little bit. So sharing seed is really, really important. Um, uh, you have to have stable genetics. You have to have uh, open pollinated or heirloom seeds that are stable and you, uh, to allow you to mix up the genetics a little bit when you share seeds, um, but that's, and which is important for helping to build resiliency. So that's, so sharing is important. And how did we get to this place of having lost so much for uh, diversity? Well, in the last 100 years, particularly the last 50, which is like two generations, um, at home and in community, we stopped saving seeds ourselves. And at the commercial level, um, so we stopped saving our own seeds and we relied on seed companies to provide seed for us. And the seed companies at the commercial level started to, um, grow more hybrids, which are unstable genetics. And so they started to reduce access to the stable genetic heirloom and open pollinated seed varieties. So they're not as available to find anymore in seed companies. That's changing a little bit with local small community seed companies and regional seed companies, uh, of which the Good Seed Company is an example. Uh, but the larger commercial seed companies uh, really have a, a, a re highly reduced 
access to open pollinated seed. The other thing is that there's more seed patenting and more restrictive licensing. So even if you did have access to seeds that were savable, it's very possible that you're not allowed to save those seeds anymore. Um, genetically modified seeds really are not um, savable for seed. And then the last thing is the consolidation of seed companies. So um, just as we've reduced this seed variety, we've also vastly reduced the number of seed companies. So I'm going to throw a slide up here that might be a little frightening, but bear with me. Um, this is the state of the um, industrial seed con construct today globally. It's owned by three major corporations. This is one, this is owned by Bayer. Um, this little thing there is Monsanto. Bayer bought Monsanto from, uh, I think it was $66 billion in 2016. What you wanna pay attention here is that the size of the circle is the market share, um, represents the market share of that company and the color of the circle. So the circle means it's a chemical company, blue means it's a seed company, and green is other company. And the, the green typically is a biotech company. Uh, my point is that there are three main companies that own over 60% of the global seed proprietary supply. Uh, Bayer, owns most of that. Uh, there's this other company called Corteva that, that's a merger between DuPont and Dow. Um, and this third one is ChemChina, a chemical company out of China together with Syngenta, which was a chemical company uh, in Europe. I think it's Switzerland has, uh, they have now merged. And the thing is, is that you can't see, but there's all these lines between them and which means they have cross licensing agreements with all of their patented seed and their hybrid seed and various other relationships. And so really, that's why I have a dotted line among them all. So that's just where that is. And why is that important? Well, the more consolidation you have, the less variety you tend to have, and the less variety you have, the less capacity you have to be resilient in the face of disruptive change. So resiliency is the capacity to respond or accommodate disruptive change and disruptive change are events that have a high impact and low predictability. COVID is a great example of that. So I bring this slide up to say that just this is sort of an evolutionary timeline. These organisms and, and species that have been around for literally hundreds of millions of years, they are demonstrated resiliency. They have been through many, many disruptive change and they're still here. There's lots of species that are not here anymore, but nonetheless, we're aware of the varieties that are. And the characteristics of resiliency, as I said, is the ability or willingness to adapt and the capacity to adapt. If you reduce your diversity, you have less of a capacity to adapt. So we newbies over here are reducing our capacity to feed ourselves by reducing our access to diverse food supplies. I did want to point out that um, uh, there is this seed vault uh, in uh, Norway that has been put together by this gentleman named Harry Fowler, and it's a fabulous effort to protect heirloom seeds around the world. They call it the Doomsday Vault. It's buried um, in the permafrost miles underground in an island in the archipelago up by the Arctic Circle and managed by the government of Norway. And uh, it's great, and it really doesn't help the state of Montana in the events of catastrophic events. So all the more reason for us to be saving seeds. So off we go to how we save seeds. So choosing plants to save seeds from and harvesting wet and dry seeds. These are gonna to go together in our conversation. Um, so let's start here. When are seeds ripe for harvesting? This is a really great question. So we're gonna divide our seeds up into what we call fruit seeds and green and root seeds. And fruit seeds are seeds that are found in fruit that we eat, or it's either the fruit that we eat or we eat the seeds that are in the fruit. So um, in that case, I would talk about say peas and beans. They're in the fruit, which is the pod, um, but they're the pea or the bean or the corn for that matter are seeds. Um, and others, um, alternatively, tomatoes we eat the fruit and the seeds are in that fruit, or melons, or cucumbers, or squash. So those are fruit seeds. And I, as compared with green and root seed, and these are plants where we typically eat the greens or the roots. And basically, we're eating the plant 
before it ever flowers and goes to seed. So saving these seeds and figuring out what to do to get them to harvest is different than the seeds where we are waiting for the fruit to form so we can eat. Um, and then a third category is flower and herb seeds, but we're gonna treat them as greens and roots. Uh, and you'll see why as we go along. Okay, so, oh, by the way, uh, there, uh, all of these slides are available as a PDF handout, and then I have some extra handouts um, that are also available as a PDF. So don't feel like you have to track all of this you know, in your notes. This will all be available. And I'm gonna follow this text with lots of pictures. So you know, just bear with me as I kind of go through this. So fruit seeds, as I said, these are tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, you know, just what you think about as, again, you're either, either eating the fruit or you're eating the seed that's in the fruit. Um, so the rule of thumb, this is really important, is you, the seed is mature when the skin changes color and or hardens. Now, sometimes we eat the fruit when the seed is mature. Most times we eat the fruit when the seed is immature. So this means that even though this is a fruit seed, we're going after, if you wanna save it for seed, you have to let that fruit mature or stay on the plant long enough for the seeds to mature. And I'll walk us through this and you'll see what I mean. Um, so again, I'm gonna show you pictures. And um, so for example, so just so you know, tomatoes and melon, think about a watermelon, we typically eat those, also winter squash. Those are, those are fruits that we eat when the seeds are ripe. However, most of the things that we eat, the seeds are not ripe. So that's cucumber, summer squash, bell pepper, corn, peas, green beans. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go along. So the second rule of thumb is to leave the fruit on the plant as long as possible. Remember, this is not about, you don't want, you're not going to be eating the fruit. You are all about letting that seed mature. And if you think about this from the point of view of the plant, the entire purpose of that plant is to make seed. Its job is to make progeny. So let that plant live as long as possible. Leave the fruit that has the seed on it on the plant for as long as possible. Let it do its thing. Um, if weather or time requires you to harvest early, you can either pick the fruit and leave it in a warm, dry, airy place to finish maturing, or for different types of plants, you'll figure this out as you go along, you can pull the whole plant up and hang the plant upside down in a warm, dry, airy place. And there's a lot of energy and life still in that plant when you harvest it, and that energy and um, the chemicals that allow for maturation will flow down to this to the fruit and it will do everything in its power to get that seed to mature that is the plant's job so um, whatever life it has in it will go to to maturing the seed and then we'll talk about clean cleaning the seeds according to this wet or dry pulp method so here's some pictures these are red peppers that we would normally harvest as red pepper and um, so that's paprika, we typically harvest it when it's red because that's what you think of. But these are jalapenos and we typically eat them green. Um, but I, this is a picture of my, have, they, they've been indoors long enough and they've turned red or I think I left them on the plant until they turned red is actually what happened. Um, these are a, uh, a green, this is a, a, a pepper variety called healthy. I had to pull them in because of weather changes. They're still green. I'm gonna leave them in their bowls until they turn red. They will eventually turn red. Do not harvest the seed, harvest the seed until they turn red. Um, uh, these are tomatoes. You can see they're kind of on their way to ripening. Just let them hang out. They'll it'll take some time, but they'll eventually ripen. Uh, the one thing, particularly with a with a soft fruit like uh, tomatoes with a you know a squishy flesh like this. If you, they'll, they'll ripen just fine like that in a bowl or in a bag, but you do want to make sure that you don't have any that have any um, uh, cuts or bruises in them that where liquid could leak out because then they'll start to um, decompose and then you'll just get the, everything associated with it will turn to mush. I'm sure everyone's had that experience in their lives. So you just, just make sure that, that the integrity of the, the surface of your 
the fruit you're trying to ripen is uh, good quality. That's because again, you're trying to go for seeds. Um, these are um, Christmas peppers that are um, drying on a, on, a, in, on a tray, or you can put them in a paper bag. And this is a picture of green beans. This is at the eating stage, which is typically about five weeks earlier than um, this dry bean stage. So again, the longer you can leave this pod on the plant, the better, but it will also ripen indoors. Um, this is zucchini. This is, you know, doesn't look anything like the zucchini that you or I would eat. That's the color it looks like when it's ready to harvest for seed. So let it get huge. Let it be that one you just let go and it will eventually turn this color and the shell will, will harden just like it would harden for winter squash. We actually eat summer squash um, when it's green. Uh, then I Here's a little note here that says, you know, you want to, so harvest it when it's yellow, you want to leave it indoors for at least a month. You want to really just let it, there's no, no harm comes to that fruit, just leaving it indoors. Um, and if skin has not been uh, damaged in any way, that, that husk is hard and will protect it. So it's not going to decompose or do anything. This is the way this plant was designed to ripen for seed. And then you just scoop it out and this is, you know, wet, sticky seed, everybody knows what that looks like. You just rinse it, rinse it, rinse it until you get all that sticky stuff off and then lay it out on wax paper or parchment paper to dry and it'll eventually turn this color white and looks just like the seed that you would buy. So um, that's easy. This, and I'll come back to why it's in a jar in a moment, but this is a, this is, this is a pickle. Again, doesn't look anything like the pickles that we typically harvest for seed. We pick heart, we pick cucumbers when they're green to eat. This cucumber, uh, pickling cucumber, is about the size of this quart jar. So needless to say, it gets big. It's yellow. The husk is hard. Um, and I've scooped it in, scooped the seeds off, and put them into a jar for a reason. We'll come to that in a minute. So whoop. What did I just do? Okay, so that minute's coming up right now. So the difference between harvesting wet and dry seed. So wet seed are seeds that have a little gel sac around them. And we know that really well with tomatoes and the other um, t common vegetable that has that gel sac are cucumbers. Um, so, and that gel sac has a, uh, enzymes in it that protect the seed from germination. So their, their job is to really keep, keep that seed from germinating early. And so what we do is uh, we do a little process that will remove that gel sac. It's very easy. This is way more information than it actually takes to, to do. It's so simple. Really all you're doing is you're putting the seed in a glass jar, you squeeze or scoop out the seeds and put them in a jar. If you need to add some liquid to it, you do so that it the seeds are floating in some kind of water. And then you just, you just let it ferment, just leave it. And you know, you can just, you'll notice that um, I just have paper towels over these things. You just want to cover them so they don't get exposed to um, dust or get, you know, bugs on them. And you just let it sit for four, three or four days. I don't have a picture of the mold, but there's a little bit of mold that will eventually form on the surface. And that mold is, uh, it's just yeast and, and bacteria from the air that are, and some of them are already on the surface of the, of the seed that will start to decompose that gel sac. And um, at, at, after four or five days, you just scrape that mold off. It's completely benign, it's not gonna hurt you. Add some water and you'll notice the ripe seeds will sink to the bottom of the jar. Then you just decant the liquid and just kind of keep rinsing, add more water and rinse the seeds until they're clean. And, you know, sometimes with the tomatoes, you'll have some tomato meat in there, just kind of scoop it out with a spoon. It's very simple, very straightforward, common sense will drive you. Um, I'm sure there's a little YouTube thing if you need it. And then you put the seeds on wax paper to dry, let them dry for 24 to 48 hours, unclump them as needed. You really don't want to leave them clumped together because they're wet and the moisture is, um, mature seeds worst enemy because it will start, you'll, you'll just get mold and you don't want that. So just check them after half a day and if they start to dry, it makes it easier to unclump them and within 24 to 30 hours, they'll be drying. Just make sure they're super dry before you put them away. If you put away damp seed, 
you've just got moldy seeds and you're gonna have to throw them away. Um, notice I have these red stars here. This is to remind me, to remind you to label. The most important thing you can do is label your seeds every step of the way when you process. Trust me when I tell you that you will forget what it is that you're harvesting or processing very fast. So don't trust your memory, use a pen and track, track the seeds every time you move them. So um, above here, we, we labeled these, like you can't see it, but these are labeled. And uh, when we put them on the wax paper, we write on the wax paper. Uh, it's the best thing you can do. And you'll discover yourself. It, you, you don't do it once and you'll never forget. So then this is just an example. Here are some uh, yellow cherry tomatoes and you know, just cut them in half, squeeze them out. And this is a, you know, a cake pan, uh, probably eight by eight or 10 by 10 of tomato seeds. And that is literally just from this bowl of cherry tomatoes. So what I want you to pay attention to is that that's a lot of seed. You know, um, there's at least 50 seeds in every tomato plant. And depending on the size, it can be up to 300 seeds. So just remember, every seed actually does make a plant. So you're not detracting from the quantity of product that you're going to use to, to feed yourself when you save some seed. There's plenty for you and plenty for uh, seed saving. Uh, there's also enough for you to seed save for yourself and to share with others. So this is where sharing seeds in your community seed libraries or with free the seeds or with your friends and neighbors or giving them to school gardens. Um, it's so important and so valuable and it really doesn't take a whole lot of time or effort. Um, here is uh, an example of me having harvested seeds from these are four different varieties of tomatoes. And it's a lot of seed that's just partial harvest and um, notice that they are well marked. Okay. Um, so this is just, the, so this is the picture of the cucumber. This is what I did with cucumbers, same process. It's just with cucumbers. So this is an example of wet seed. And even though these are in slimy, sticky, you know, stringy stuff that comes inside a squash, they're not wet seed. You, all you have to do is rinse these and they're ready to go. They don't have that gel sac. The gel sac is simply the definition of what we talk about when we talk about wet seed. Okay. So now here's the deal so now we're going to go to the other type of seeds so these are plants that we call greens and roots again these are plants where we typically eat the green or the root so it's either the lettuce or the beet or the carrot right when you eat the, le the, le the lettuce or the beet or the carrot you never see it go to flower so what's, how do you do it so here's the deal this is a picture you got to let you got to basically leave the plant alone and let it do its thing and um, this is what a lettuce plant looks like when it pulls and you leave it alone. This is about four feet tall. Okay, it takes a long time. So it, it's different time and different spacing uh, that you have to accommodate when you want to let a, green, a greener root plant go to seed. Um, again, once the seed has set, and if time is short or weather is requiring you to pull the plant, you can do that. You can pull the plant, whole plant, hang it upside down in a warm, dry, airy place, and it will continue its maturation. To the best of your ability, give it as much time in the ground as it can. So the other thing, other rule of thumb is to know your plant's seed dispersal mechanism. You know, some pods burst, um, brassicas, mustards, and cauliflowers, and pea pods can do that. So if you're worried at all, lettuce plants can do that as well. If you're worried about that at all, you can cover the top of the plant with a paper bag and tie, just tie a twist tie around it, and it'll capture any seeds that might start to uh, release while you're letting the whole plant ripen. Um, I'm gonna go through more of this with pictures. So just in terms of time and spacing and thought process, and we'll go through this when we talk about garden planting. Radish and lettuce planted in April will produce ripe seed by late September. So uh, that's a long time. That's a whole lot longer than we think about when we're thinking about radish and lettuce that we're going to eat. Um, and then there's a variety of the brassica plants, and brassicas are your kales and your cauliflowers, broccoli, and uh, collars and Brussels sprouts, things like that. They all um, 
Sometimes they can uh, produce seed in the first year, but a lot of them actually produce seed in their second year, particularly beets and carrots. So uh, a lot of root vegetables will produce their seed the second year. The plant will spend its time creating, um, the root is actually a storage vehicle for the plant to store food that it then uses in the second year to make flowers and seed. So it's a storage bank, if you will, for the plant when they have a, a root, which we then eat. Okay, so more about this. So for example, this is a picture of a beet um, that's been let go. It's actually a, a forage beet, but you can see how big it gets. Um, this is actually close to the, the half this is the size of a, a radish that's gone to seed. So this is what carrots look like uh, if you let them grow into their second year and they form these umbrels. These are the flowers that will eventually uh, mature into seeds. So nobody ever sees that because we eat the, we eat the roots normally. Um, this is my favorite harvesting tool. This, the, I highly recommend these. These are about two bucks a piece. You know, they're almost as tall as I am. They're made out of paper. So they're environmentally friendly. They're very sturdy. And I will, when I harvest a whole plant, particularly like a mustard plant or a brassica or anything like that, I can literally pull the whole plant and just turn it upside down and put it in this big bag and then leave it in a cool, dry place, say my garage for a while and just let the seeds go on and mature. And um, it'll capture any seeds that burst open uh, in that process. These are some examples. These are poppies, nature's favorite pop top. Go look at your poppies sometime. When this is still green, this uh, and the seeds in, that live in here are immature, this top is, uh, there's no gap here. It's just um, touching this, this border here. But when this, when the poppies seeds are ripe, then the pop top opens. And then as the wind blows, these um, tops sway in the breeze and the seeds fall over and disappear. And this of course is, uh, you can tell very easily that these are just about to take off into the wind. This is um, showy milkweed, which is the host plant for monarch butterflies. They, every part of, the, every stage of the monarch butterfly from larva to uh, butterfly uh, feeds on this plant. So we want to make sure there's lots of these around. Um, processing, these are marigold heads that are ready to go to seed. I mean, the seeds are, are, have now been harvested. All we've done is cut off the dead heads uh, once they've gone to seed and they're now gathered in a bowl. These are straw flowers. This is sunflower. Um, very different, you know, this types of form. And the, the, the ways to actually clean the seeds are very simple and they really haven't changed very much for 10,000 years. Um, very basic tools. So if you've got seeds in a shell that you want to break open, uh, the really, the most fun way is to do some seed dancing. So these are people, this is in my garage one winter, this is outside at Columbia Falls Library, and we've just got all these seeds between layers of tarps and people are just taking turns, dancing jigs on them and breaking open the pods. So it's a lot of fun. Um, then over here are some, you can see there's colanders and strainers. That's, these are all just kitchen tools that are really useful for um, separating the chaff from the seed. And then we have a series of screens. These are just window, uh, these are just picture frames that somebody took the glass out and put a, a screen in. And then these folks have made some screens with different um, uh, size mesh, window size meshes and just different size mesh you can get at the hardware store. And that'll give you different ways to catch the chaff from different size seeds. And then these are just folks, literally, you're just figuring it out, playing, um, sh you know, shaking the, the processing material through this screen. And, and then there's a bin here that's catching most of the chaff and maybe this, I don't know what these are, the seeds are gonna stay uh, in, on the screen. Um, here's, you can do it anywhere and literally with anything. So this, we did, this is how we clean seeds for free the seeds one year. We did it in the hallway outside the seed processing shop. And, uh, we did it with hair dryers. You know, oftentimes if it's summertime, you can do it outside and the wind will blow the chaff off. 
but if you're indoors, you can use a hair dryer. And we have all these bins uh, lined up because as you um, provide the surface, the wind to the to the bowl, the chaff and some of the seeds will will flow into these bins. Um, so you want to catch as much as you can. Uh, and these are just kitchen strainers using uh, in bowls to separate the seeds from the chaff. Very simple, very easy. Uh, and I think there was something else. Let's see. Well, I guess I, oops, sorry. I'm going too fast. I think I'm going to come back to the point I'll make. I want to make right now, but I'll make it a little bit later. So very simple. The biggest piece is letting the seeds mature before you try to process them and process them dry. Make sure everything's dry. Uh, once you're, you've done that, you're good to go. I mean, and I will, I do get questions about germ testing and seed viability, so I'm going to walk us through it. But to be honest, if I were a home grower, if I didn't have the seed company, I would not take, spend my time germ testing unless it was just out of curiosity. Germ testing, I'm sorry, means germination testing. So step one is how do I store my seeds? You want to store them in a cool, dry, dark location. Again, moisture, light, uh, and heat are the death of seeds. Moisture because they'll mold, um, heat because they'll start to uh, decompose, they'll start to oxidize, they'll start to um, degrade, and light because. So, having said that, you literally, uh, a, a cool dark closet in your house is really all you need. Um, and of course, label, otherwise, you're just guessing. And at a minimum, really for most every seed, except the alliums, which are your garlic, your onions, and your chives, and also some parsnips, most seeds are viable for at least three to five years. Tomato seeds do well for, gosh, I don't know, eight to 10 years. But, you know, just so don't worry. These seeds, they've been, <laughs> they've been developing their technology for many, many thousands and hundreds of millions of years. So they know how to they know how to stay viable if we don't expose them to environments that will degrade them. This is just an example of uh, those, all those, those dry tomato seeds that you saw drying on wax paper. This is what they look like once they were put in their bags. And I had a new variety called Mosquita. And I, I just took some quick notes uh, about this variety because I wasn't familiar with it. I have other notes, but this reminds me right where the seeds are, some pieces about it that I, I want to keep track of. So at a minimum, I have the year, uh, where I grew it, and what it's called. Whoops. Okay. I guess that's that. Um, let's see. So, and then just here's some pieces of information. This is mustard seed. This is a rare variety of mustard seed. It's very hard to find it. Uh, but I just want you to note, these are, this is a quart-sized jar. This is from four to six plants, one harvest. This is three quarters of a quart of seeds. Every single one of those seeds will make a plant. So, like I said, it doesn't take much. This is a perennial herb called summer savory. Um, it lives in one of my gardens. Uh, it produces seed every year. Uh, and this is one harvest, one year. This is a pint of seeds. That's a lot of seed. Again, minimal effort on my part. And uh, I got a lot of seed that I can keep for my company, for my own personal use, and to sell. I mean, and to give away and share with others. Again, here is kind of a little hard to see. This is red poppy. This is technically an annual flower, although frankly, the plant in my, in my garden uh, uh, survives the winter and lives on. Um, so this is one plant. This is just 15 flower heads that I let go to seed. If any of you have poppies, you know that that's maybe a third or a, fr or a quarter of the number of flowers that um, this one plant can produce. And this is over a cup of seeds. Like I said, that's a lot of seeds. So again, there's plenty for you to enjoy in blossoms and also to save seed from and share with others. Oh, so this is the point I wanted to make uh, earlier, which is that, you know, I talk about processing seeds and how to get the chaff away from the seed. And that's all good. And you know, it's fun to do and it's useful to do, but the, 
you don't, there really is not a need to get every last piece of chaff out if this is just for your home use, or even if you're just sharing with others in, at a seed um, swap or whatever. So like this level of chaff, these are chive seeds and I can do the next step and I do do a next step for the seed company, but don't feel you have to get rid of all the chaff. It's, it's not gonna hurt your seed uh, and if, as long as everything's dry, it's not going to have any impact. And you know, you have, you may have other things you want to do with your time. And honestly, this is just, uh, these are marigolds that I haven't um, yet cleaned. It has all, it still has petals associated with it, but you know, uh, I, lots of people just put this in a bag and, and call it good. So that's, it's certainly okay to do that. And just to the seed viability, I just want to take this picture to show you. Um, this is Rowan White, who is an extraordinary seed steward. And this is an eight, this is squash grown from 800 year old seed that was found in, this, uh, in the Southwest in a native seed container. So just so you know, seeds know what they're doing. Okay, so germination testing. So this germination tells is, is, is a process for figuring out how well, how viable your seeds are. And there's two ways to do it. Um, like I said, this is something you can do it and it might be fun to do, but you, you literally have no need to do it as a home grower. Uh, uh, if I worry about seed germination for my home use, I just plant more seed. So uh, that's my, you know, I do it, I, I do it because I want to, at, for the seed company, because I want to be able to um, assure my customers a certain level of germination viability, but that's that's just a function of because I sell the seed. Anywho, the paper towel method. So basically you're tricking the seed into thinking that it's growing in an environment where it's time to germinate. So what you do is you, you dampen a paper towel, you arrange the seeds on a grid. So here's Margaret in the process of doing a grid of 10 by 10. Um, which is 100 seeds. And the reason for that is because you can just count how many then germinate and, and then you'll know the percentage. But you can do any number you want. Um, then you want to label the paper towel with a ballpoint pen. Don't use a felt tip because it'll just, um, you know, melt. It'll just uh, spread with the liquid. And then you want to roll the paper towel up carefully and place it in a Ziploc bag. Label the Ziploc bag and place in a warm location for the expected germination time. So I typically, like if I'm gonna do this, I will, and I'm doing it in a cool, at a cool time of year, I'll roll up my, my Ziploc bags and I'll put them between like layers of, a, of towels or I'll put them um, you know, inside a, a sleeping bag or something where it'll have a consistent temperature and it's not exposed to cool air breezes or and it's not too hot. And that's just so that they have a steady state temperature that they, they'll work with. And it may take a little bit longer than your standard germination time, depending on how warm it is. Uh, but, so give yourself, so you know, for things that typically germinate seven to 10 days, give yourselves two weeks. And then you unroll it, and then you measure, you count how many of them have some kind of a little cotyledon or germ sprout happening. Um, a seed has all the food it needs to, to get going. So it has enough food inside itself to start its own root and, and do those first two layers, two sets of leaves that you see pushing through the soil. So you don't have to, so they're self-sufficient and um, you're just giving them an environment to tell them to get going. Uh, works really well with large seeds if you're using small seed like mustard seed. And it doesn't work if you've got light sensitive seed, which is a lot of herb seeds, but all food seeds that we use for agriculture work fine with this method. The other method, which I can tend to do because I find it easier for large scale stuff, is to do the soil method. And I actually, I'll use clamshells like this, although they don't typically have the holes in them, and I fill it with soil, wet soil or wet sand. And then you do that same grid with your seed and then close the lid and it'll keep itself moist. Um, you know, if it's a, it's a true, if it's a true take out clamshell, it'll keep the moisture in and uh, keep the temperature in a uh, steady state. And then you just wait for those plants to grow. And then as the cotyledon shows up, you, you just count those. Um, let's see. 
you do that the downside for this is that you, they take up space and uh, it's not so easy in the winter time because now the soil is not at, at the desired temperature so you know just use your judgment okay so that's that now we're going to talk about um, planning next year's garden with seed saving in mind so again as we talked earlier greens and root seed plants take a long time to flower and they and produce seed and they tend to grow and take up space so you want to figure that out with your garden planning the other thing you want to think about is you want to avoid saving seed across multiple species that tend to cross pollinate um, because you'll you'll they'll just combine so if you I'm not going to go into some into detail about the cross pollination varieties, but there are uh, there are a number of uh, videos from past classes at Free the Seeds in the video library for Free the Seeds that you can access that goes into that really well. I think they're all called Seed Saving 101, and you're welcome to those. Uh, and there are also the book resources I'll give you at the end. We'll walk, and I'm happy to talk with you at also but i didn't think that was a, appropriate for this conversation um and then again most plants produce a lot of seed for home use and for sharing you really don't need a lot of plants and i hope i've convinced you of that and i hope i've convinced you that it's worth your while to, to save seed because it's just so it's so empowering it's so great to, to save the lettuce seed you know from this plant planted and then oh my god you've got lettuce the next year it's just amazing it feels it's a great empowerment feeling so if you're just starting out with seed saving this is a list of um, plant varieties plant types that uh, don't cross pollinate so they're super easy you don't have to think about that whole issue beans peas tomatoes peppers eggplant and lettuces so i really invite you to um, start with these and just give it a go you, there, there's truly no wrong here uh, and even if you don't label the seed that you save well it's just a mystery uh, seed that you plant next year you'll figure it out next year um, here are some resources that uh, are, are in the handouts as well um, on seed saving because I've just kind of walked us through some basics but this is a really nice free download that um, um, Siskiyou Seeds in Oregon put together some years ago. These are my three favorite seed saving books. And then these are my two favorite books on um, learning about the microbes in your soil and how to build healthy soil too, because it turns out that it's the microbes in the soil that are feeding, this, that are feeding the plants that are feeding